Hello and welcome to this video on how I created a 10 by 21 segment RGB LED display which is still a work in progress by the way as we shall see. Unfortunately I can't take credit for this idea nor its base design as the first version of a 21 segment display was conceived and a patent registered back in the 1890s by George L Mason. Please see links in the description below for more detail. In addition a good friend of mine Paul Parry of Bad Dog Designs invited me to join a smart sockets group founded and led by Chris Barron and John Smout. Again, please see links in the description. John had wanted to recreate a 21 segment display for some time, but as a smart socket using RGB LEDs. As I have had some experience with RGB LEDs, including diffusing them for an earlier clock project, Paul thought this experience could be useful to the group. Paul and I wanted our displays to be driven by a single device, such as an Arduino. By comparison, the remainder of the group wanted to develop various smart socket versions using PIC micros. As a result, our development efforts split somewhat, although we did keep each other informed as to what we were doing. John led the design for these new displays, including things like size and aspect ratio, and after we had decided on which RGB LEDs to use, John also shared an initial PCB layout. Even though John had kindly provided the base designs, I recreated everything myself using tools I was familiar with, like Fusion 360 and Easy EDA. In order to create these displays, there are four main features required to make them functional. The RGB LEDs, a PCB to carry the LEDs, a shell to reflect the display's Victorian style, a diffuser giving each segment even illumination. So first up, let's have a look at the LEDs. The LEDs we chose were the 2mm square WS2812 2020s. Although these are smaller than regular WS2812 devices, they have relatively large solder pads, which means it's possible to solder them by hand with some practice. There are two variants of these LEDs called B and C. The B variant has an operating current of 12 milliamps per channel, while the C variant draws only 5 milliamps per channel. I ordered several units of each so I could compare the two types for brightness and colour. More on this in a moment. Next up, the circuit board design. While I waited for the LEDs to arrive, I drew up a PCB design using Easy EDA PCB software. From the schematic I created, you can see that I laid out the LEDs to reflect the segment design, and each of the 35 LEDs are simply connected in a chain. Next, I created a PCB layout. This was similar to an earlier design that John had created using Osmond PCB tool. The board is double-sided with components on both sides, the LEDs and their decoupling capacitors on one side, and the remaining components on the other. Power is provided via 5 volts and ground copper fills, which pretty much means it's only signal tracks to be routed between adjacent LEDs in the chain. With the PCB layout now created, I then modelled the board in 3D to get a better idea of how it would look. Once I was satisfied with the design, I sent the Gerber files off to JLC PCB in China to have 10 bare boards made. This cost only 5 US dollars plus postage for all 10 boards. Less than a week later the boards arrived, closely followed by the LEDs. I would just like to mention that this video is not sponsored in any way and that I have no affiliation with any of the vendors referenced. To compare the two LED types, I soldered one of each onto a PCB and lit them both with an identical cycle of different colours at maximum brightness. Although the image shown here doesn't adequately demonstrate the differences, the C variant to the left was noticeably dimmer to the eye than the B variant on the right. Now although the C variant was dimmer, at full brightness it would definitely be an adequate choice, so I fed this information back to the Smart Sockets group. I decided however that I would go with the brighter B variant, which would allow me to achieve brighter displays while still providing me with the ability to reduce the brightness in software if required. I should also note that there was a slight hue difference between the two LED types, and sufficient enough for it to be noticeable if the two LED types were used in the same display, but not a problem otherwise. Having decided on my choice of LED, I now needed to solder up my first full circuit board. Soldering the LEDs and the even smaller 0402 SMD decoupling capacitors proved to be quite a challenge and took two to three hours. The biggest issue was my aging eyesight more than anything else and in the end I had to seek the aid of a digital microscope. But trying to manipulate the components and solder them in effectively 2D took a lot of getting used to but I eventually got the hang of it. As a proof of concept for the initial 10 boards, manual soldering was fine. However, for greater quantities, full-on professional PCB assembly would be my recommendation. Next up is the shells, which are currently 3D printed items due to the popularity and cheapness of 3D printers. 
Other manufacturing processes could be used, but I have a 3D printer, so that's the route I took. John had created a couple of early segment designs that I ended up recreating in Fusion 360 as 2D sketches. These are then extruded into a 3D model that can then be exported to an STL file ready for 3D printing. From my earlier clock designs, I knew that the optimum distance between the PCB and the diffuser was approximately 10mm, so this will be the depth for these shells. I will just quickly demonstrate the process for creating the shells from 3D modelling to 3D printing. To start with I have three sketches, one for the cutouts and fixing holes and two for the different 21 segment designs. Having selected my preferred 21 segment design, I'll just rotate the sketch for a better view for when it's extruded. The extrude command is then selected from the create drop down menu and the main outline excluding the cutouts and segments is then selected from the sketch and a value of minus 10mm is entered for the distance. The extrude command is selected once more, along with the two rectangular cutouts, and this time the value of minus 3mm is entered for the distance. The cutouts cater for the header pin solder joints on the back of the PCB, by the way. We just need to turn the cutout sketch back on so we're able to create the eight fixing holes. Now we select the hole command from the create drop down menu and select the eight holes from the sketch. These holes need to pass through the full depth of the model and will be tapped at 3mm. Four outer holes are for attaching the PCB to the back of the shell and the four inner holes are for attaching a front bezel. From the hole properties window, the tap through hole is selected, the depth set at 10mm, a 3mm thread selected and the model checkbox ticked which will allow us to see the thread on the 3D model. I'll just spin the model around and turn off the sketches so that we can see the completed model from the front and now it's ready to be exported as an STL file for 3D printing. I'll just rename the default body name, in this case to Shell. Then right click the body name and select Save as STL from the list of options. Keeping the default options, click OK and then save the file. Next I switch to my 3D printer slicer software Simplify 3D and import the shell STL file that was just created. So as to avoid any support structures, the model is best printed on its front face, so it is laid flat and re-centred on the bed, and can now be prepared for printing. Just before we export the G-code file for the 3D printer, it's worth just reviewing how the slicer has created the print layers, as you can see here with the animation option. I won't be discussing the actual slicer and printer settings here as they will most likely be different to anyone else's setup. For me the final step here is to save the toolpath, or G-code if you prefer, to SD card. The SD card is then transferred to the 3D printer so the shell can be printed. And what you can see here is the shell being printed using grey MatForge PLA filament. And finally here is the completed shell. Along with a fully populated PCB and the shell after the internal faces of the segments were painted white. And now we move on to the diffuser. Although viewing the LEDs directly inside the segments is attractive in its own right, in this instance I actually prefer not to see the LEDs, but rather view each segment lit as evenly as possible, which means the need for a diffuser. From the experience I gained with my clock project, I discovered that thin plastic numbered ring binder inserts act as a reasonable diffuser and that these were relatively cheap and readily available from a popular stationary outlet. The plastic inserts I'm using to diffuse the segments is very flimsy and therefore feel it should be applied to the shells using some kind of adhesive. One way to do this would be with double sided sticky tape. Being that the shells are 50mm wide I purchased some 50mm wide tape. I had tried two strips of 25mm tape, but the join could be seen through the diffuser. A word of warning though, if the shells are painted in any way, and I'll be discussing painting later, let the paint dry thoroughly before applying the diffuser, otherwise the paint can affect the adhesive properties of the tape and make it less efficient at sticking. The paint type can also make a difference, for example, white primer has almost no effect on the tape or the diffuser, but white top coat I found can affect both. So here is a completed shell with its diffuser attached. And all we need to do now is attach a fully populated circuit board to the back of the shell and power it up for a quick test. Ideally the shells would be best printed in white PLA as white gives the brightest results. 
However, there doesn't seem to be a white filament available that's fully opaque, thus we end up with light bleed, as shown in this left-hand example. Printing the shells in black or grey PLA eliminates light bleed altogether, but affects the overall brightness somewhat, as shown by the middle example. To work around both of these unwanted effects, it looks best to print in, say, grey PLA and paint the insides of the segments white to boost the brightness back up again, as shown in the right-hand example. To clearly show the difference between painted and unpainted segments, you can see here with the diffuser removed that the painted segments on the right have a much nicer glow about them when compared to the unpainted example on the left. I really have no desire to be painting the shells, and discussing it with a friend, we came up with the idea of 3D printing some white shell inserts instead. I did find the need to modify the shell design, however, and introduce a lip around each segment so as to hide the front face of the insert, which otherwise produces an unwanted halo effect due to light bleed. As you can see from this image, it worked really well. Actually, I was rather proud that I'd managed to make this idea work as well as it did. There is a downside though. It reduces the lit area of each segment, or looking at it another way, it increases the width of the unlit region between each segment by quite a bit, and therefore looks less attractive than the thinner walled painted version that you can see here. I have to admit that for small quantities, painting dark coloured shells is probably the best way to go, but for larger quantities I would prefer alternative materials and manufacturing processes. By this time I had created 10 complete displays and now wanted to join them all together. My good friend Max Maxfield, who also wanted 10 of these displays, had discussed brass bezels with me. I created the design here specifically for Max, but I wanted something a little less intricate myself and came up with this design instead. As a proof of concept, I decided to 3D print my bezels, but due to the printer capabilities and the full width of the bezel being 540mm long, I had to print the bezel in two parts. Once the parts were printed, I then sprayed them with a brass effect paint. The matte forge PLA is actually quite soft, and flexes being it's only 1mm thick, so the full display was never going to be rigid enough. I therefore designed some long support bars to link the backs of the displays together, thus making the whole creation more rigid. I also fashioned some feet on the bottom support bars so the display can freestand until I get around to building a proper case for it. Here is a quick sequence of the final assembly. Cutting away the diffuser from around the bezel fixing holes prevents the diffuser from rucking up when the screws are inserted and tightened. Since building my 10 displays I did order up another 30 boards, 10 each for myself, Max, Paul and a friend of Max, but this time fully assembled from Elecro in China. I had used Elecro previously to assemble my custom clock PCBs I'd designed, and the quality and service provided by Elecro was fantastic. In fact I had these revised clock PCBs manufactured at the same time as the 21 segment display PCBs, but the revised clock design is a topic for another video. This project will primarily be used for displaying the time, and it needs an enclosure, dedicated control board, and some software to drive it beyond the current demo sequences, so I still have quite a bit more work to do on it. So until the next video, please leave your comments, and like, share and subscribe. Thank you for watching.